Recently, uh, Post Tribune reporter Gary Davich shared this article from the Indiana branch of the ACLU, the American Liberties Union. Dateline Indianapolis. Today, the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals affirmed a federal court district court's ruling striking down House Enrolled Act 1337, which would have banned women from obtaining abortions based on their reason for seeking one. Seventh Circuit Judge William J. Bauer wrote that these, quote, provisions clearly violate this well-established Supreme Court precedent and are therefore unconstitutional. ACLU of Indiana Executive Director Jane Hennigar made this statement. In striking down this extreme abortion ban, the court once again affirmed a woman's fundamental right make her own personal medical decisions. This ruling is a victory for women and another repudiation of attempts by Indiana politicians to restrict and even ban access to abortion care. Deeply personal decisions about abortions should be made by women in consultation with their doctors, not by politicians or government bureaucrats. House Enrolled Act 1337 signed into law by former Governor Mike Pence on March 24th, 2016, would have imposed unprecedented restrictions on abortion. The act barred a woman from getting an abortion based on her reason. Specifically, it would have prohibited abortions if the sole reason for the abortion is the baby's race, color, national origin, ancestry, sex, or diagnosis of a statutorily defined disability or potential diagnosis of a disability. The case, Planned Parenthood of Indiana and Kentucky, et cetera, versus the commissioner, Indiana State Department of Health, prosecutors of Marion, Lake, Monroe, and Tippecanoe counties, individual members of the Medical Licensing Board of Indiana. Case number 116-CV-00763. EWP PML was filed Thursday, April 7th, 2016, in the U.S. District Court, Southern District of Indiana, Indianapolis Division. For the sole reason of race, color, national origin, ancestry, sex, or diagnosis of a disability. Extreme. That's the world in which we now live. Bow your heads with me as I pray. Lord God, bless your word wherever it is proclaimed. Make it a word of power and peace. Convert those not yet your own and to confirm those who have come to saving faith. May your word pass from the ear to the heart, from the heart to the lip, and from the lip to the life, so that, as you have promised, your word may achieve the purpose for which you send it, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our readings today talked about the Lord being our shepherd and how he cares for us. Jesus' words were spoken in a particular context. That context I'm going to share with you. It's actually found a chapter previously in the ninth chapter of the Gospel of John. And it actually begins with the first verse. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents? He was born blind. Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said those things, spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva. 
And he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. One of my colleagues in seminary uh, shared an article with me. He has a son with special needs. Uh, Brother Kyle Blake is pastor of the Gathering Lutheran Church in Long Beach, California, where Lanita grew up. This article is found in the website RaisingTheExtraordinary.com. It's an article that talks about the challenges of being the parents of a special needs child. One of the worst aspects of that pro of it is that the problem develops in such a way that we don't even notice it. The same things also apply to those who are caregivers, excuse me, of the elderly. And this, what I'm about to share with you, is just a portion from that article. It talks about isolation. When the isolation escalates, then it happens. Our kids start getting older, but they're not meeting milestones. Not only that, but what the gap between our special needs child's abilities and that of their peers grows. What was once a small dip we could easily step over has suddenly become as wide as the Grand Canyon. Suddenly, we can't do play dates. On the rare occasion we're still invited for a play date, we find ourselves facing hard choices. While other kids are now free to run and play, our child isn't capable. Special needs moms, this means we have to choose. We stay with our child and help them participate with the other kids as much as possible, or we sit and socialize with the other moms, making our child sit with us. No one wins in this scenario. Either moms miss out on conversation with other moms, or the child misses out on being with his peers. This, of course, is happening at a time when these relationships are crucial for the moms and the kids. And the worst part is those on the outside of special needs parenting don't see it. You know, the Jews did not believe that, that man had been born blind and had received his sight. So they called the parents of that man and ask them, is this your son who was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, well, we know that this is our son. He was born blind. How he now sees, we don't know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he's of age. He will answer for himself. The text tells us that his parents said these things because they feared the Jews, but the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. You know, as human beings, we want to be part of a community. Most of us prefer living in the city to living in an isolated place piece of land reliant upon the work of our own hands to supply all of our needs and creature comforts. How many of you could build a house with your own hands, kill and butcher a deer, grow or harvest a crop of fruit, grain, and vegetables while maintaining a supply of milk cows and steers, breeding and food? Brother Jim said yes to the first part at least, and I'm going to tell you, I used to go down south every summer, and right now I couldn't do it. Uh, -uh. I don't want to get out. Mm -mm. No, 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 no. A chicken would not die on my watch. The fact is, we need each other, and we want each other, unless the other person is a burden. Then we want to separate them from us, lest we somehow become defiled. We have some special needs students at Ascension. We have students like that because the public school didn't want to deal with them anymore. Our schools didn't want to deal with them. They came to us. 
it's not an easy task being an educator of special needs kids. It's like it's not an easy task being a parent of one. And then on top of that, your friend, colleague, who you lean on for support, well, they really don't know what to say or what to do. And so you both become uncomfortable. But Jesus, he doesn't run from those, those kind of situations, does he? Just like he didn't run from us. People who are descendants of slaves who were valued little more than the cattle or the pigs or the chicken, except for the fact that we could do work for free. He didn't run from us but he ran to us. He brought his healing virtue into our lives, just like, like he brings it into the lives of those special children or those elderly parents. And we are healed, no longer subject to rejection because we are united by baptism into his death and resurrection, sustained by his life-giving spirit through word and sacrament, 1 Corinthians 15 and 45. I'll take a couple seconds so you can find it. I told you, you're going to need your Bibles today. When you're ready, say amen. All right. Rest y'all better catch up. 1 Corinthians 15 and 45. Amen. All right, the pages have stopped turning, so I guess we're ready. Trap in and let's go. Thus it is written, the first Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Now turn to Romans 6 and 4. Oh, yeah, I know some of them, some of them Bibles are creaking a little bit right now. And then, wait a minute, why are y'all working me so hard? Romans 6 and 4. Yep. All right, here we go. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Amen. You know, the world that does not know him nor his voice rejects what you just read, and therefore it rejects those who have been healed by him, because the world despises the foolishness of preaching. Turn to John chapter nine, or back to John chapter nine, nine twenty-four. So, for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, Whether he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know, though I was blind, now I see. Hmm. Then in verse 31, he continues, We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. He answered him, you were born in utter sin. Would you teach us? And they cast him out. They cast him out for telling the truth as it was in Christ Jesus. They rejected the pure gospel is presented by this man. Now, I'm not saying that everything he said was just right because he did throw a little law in there by saying that, well, if you do God's will, he answers your prayer. He wasn't actually talking about himself. He was talking about Jesus. He's saying it because Jesus is clearly someone who is able to do this for me. He must be a man of God. Y'all want to call him a sinner, but when's the last time you saw a sinner that could do something like this? 
He wasn't speaking saying, I was so righteous that God gave me my sight. Because if that was the case, he would have said that a long time ago. He knew that he was a man born blind. He couldn't have done anything as far as he knew from the womb, in the womb, what opportunities would he have in the womb? And yet he was born blind. Did his parents do something? But would it be just of God when the parents did wrong to lay the burden of that on the child? So that didn't make sense, but nevertheless, people want to blame somebody. People like blaming you for things. When things fall your way, when you're going through a struggle, they want to blame you. This is not happening to them. And therefore, they must have been doing right. But oh, how many times can you think of things that have befallen you because you live in a fallen world? How many times have you had to run twice as hard to travel half as far, jump twice as high to get to the same height, push twice as hard to get to the same place? How many times have you experienced the rough side of life when all you were trying to do was love your neighbor as yourself? Why, if the good things in life were based on who did right and who did wrong, how in the world would secular artists who sing about nothing but sin and depravity ride through life on flowery beds of ease? And people that work hard, try to do the right thing, help their neighbor, teach our children, and they struggle from paycheck to paycheck. How would that be if doing right brought reward guaranteed in this life. As I look at some of you now, I know you've lived rich lives, full lives, but now time and your bodies are betraying you. Can't move as fast as you used to. Can't walk as long as you once could. Can't eat some of the stuff you used to like. The reason I know these things is I'm right there with you. And I know full well that this isn't falling our lot because we was so bad. We wasn't no worse than anybody else because the Bible says all have sinned. So if we're hitting our lot because we're sinners, then the rest of y'all ought to be leaning over, having a cane, taking pills, drinking soup right with us. But no. Bible says time and chance happen to all. But then the word of God goes on. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Flutter, 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 flutter. I love the sound of pages turning. Yes, indeed. First starting in verse 9. Chapter 6, starting in verse 9. Or do you not know that the righteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, men who practice homosexuality, thieves, nor the greedy, drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Oh, I know you might live good while you're down here. But when the kingdom of God comes, there's going to be a shift in the atmosphere. But let me continue. Because such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. Amen. Yes, indeedy. You know, me and Pastor Rick got into a conversation about that last Monday. He asked the question, are you sanctified or are you just called sanctified? And I had to say that we are sanctified by the waters of baptism because that's what the word says right there. You were washed. You were sanctified. God wasn't waiting to see. Would you clean up your act? 
when you went down in the waters of baptism and the word of the gospel promise was spoken over your life, God set you apart to himself. You belong to him. You can go ahead and clap on that. Yes, he did it. God did it. He wasn't waiting for you. If he had to wait on us to sanctify ourselves, he'd still be waiting. He didn't have time for that. He got work for you to do, and it's a work that only sanctified folks can do. So he sanctified you right there. The only thing he asked us parents to do was train you up as a sanctified child. Teach you God's word as a sanctified child. Disciple you as a sanctified child. And then expect that God's word would bear fruit. Part of our problem is we, we take them to the baptismal font, but we don't have no expectation. We baptize them and then we just let them go on their own way. Hope that the word of God will catch them somewhere by the time confirmation. No, don't do that. Start out when they're little. That way it won't be so hard on them when they're a teenager. Amen? Yes, indeedy. But here's something even better. At that water right there, that pure water, we who were once fragmented by our selfishness, by our greed and our pain and our guilt have been made whole through the blood of Jesus. Now, so you know I'm not just talking. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 and 13. Mm. Told you God was gonna speak a lot of words to you today. You ready? Amen. For just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, to one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we're all made to drink of one spirit. I don't care where you come from. Don't care what you look like. Don't care about your lineage. When you came into that water, Jesus united you to himself. I don't care what your position of privilege was. I don't care. Your daddy might have been a slave owner or it might have been a slave. It don't matter. The moment that God caused the water of the baptism to come to those slave lives, slavery was doomed, y'all. It was just a matter of time because the Lord is a good shepherd and he's got but one flock. And his flock that owned slaves couldn't keep on mistreating their brothers who they made slaves. Their brothers who were slaves couldn't stay looking at themselves as cattle once the waters of Jesus came into their lives. There's no way you can accept being nothing when you know that in heaven you are a son of the most high. Praise God. People want to know how did we survive all that. That's how we survived all that, because the blood of Jesus, the spirit of our God. People ask, why wasn't there a bloodbath when the Civil War ended? Again, it was the blood of Jesus, the spirit of our God. That's what kept us holy. That's what kept us loving. And that's why things aren't the way they were. That's why too many people don't think that this water has any power. They ask the question, uh, you talk about that baptism stuff, how can water do all this? Well, clearly the water doesn't do it, not by itself, but the word of God, which is with and alongside the water and faith, which trusts this word of God, does it. Without the word of God, the water is just water. Not a baptism, but with the word of God, it is a baptism, a grace filled water of life and a bath of the new birth in the Holy Spirit. Yes, Lord. Now that brings us to our gospel text. That brings us 
why Jesus said these words. He didn't just say, I am the good shepherd because he was standing in the field looking at a bunch of sheep. No, he said, I am the good shepherd because he had just talked to the man born blind, the man that had been kicked out of the synagogue, the man had been treated as less than a full member of the community. And he looked at that man, that man who had just said to him, who is the son of man that I can believe on him? He said, it's me. And that man worshiped him. Jesus was looking at him when he said, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. He was looking at that man who had born, been born blind when he said, just like the father knows me and I know the father. He was looking at that man and his parents when he said, I lay down my life for the sheep. He was looking at that man. He was thinking of those special needs children. He was thinking of those aborted babies. He was thinking of those descendants of slaves. He was thinking of all those people that are marginalized and pushed to the side. And he said, I have other sheep, not of this fold. And I've got to bring them also. I've got to bring the ones that the church growth folk don't think about. I must bring the ones that the ones who want to build a mega church are thinking about. Uh, he said, I'm thinking about those that don't have enough money for the buy-in. I'm thinking about those that don't have the nice property and the nice positions and all those wonderful things that the world has seen. I'm thinking about them because those are my sheep too. See, in the kingdom, there are no sub-saints. ain't no second-class Christians. The word of God declares no one in the kingdom of God is less equal, less holy, less beloved of the Father. Let me go back to Romans chapter 9, verse 25 and 26. Hmm. I think I don't know what I'm talking about. Well, don't, don't pay no attention to me. Pay attention to what God says right here. As indeed he says in Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call my people. Those who are not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called the sons of the living God. Yes, he did it. He says it to those whom the world despises and rejects. You're my child. He says it because he knows how it feels to be despised and rejected of men. He says it to those who are sorrowful because he knows what it is to be a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He knows how it is. That same Lord Jesus who gave sight to the blind man empowers his church today to speak his life-giving word, that word that draws people to the Lord Jesus, that word that brings those who are hungry for love to the one who is love, to those who are thirsting for justice, to the one who is a just God and a savior. Amen. You know, the parents of that blind man, they were afraid. They were afraid of being rejected, afraid of being ridiculed. They were afraid of being alone. So they stepped back. You know, some who were baptized in the Christ have done the same thing. They're afraid of being ridiculed for their faith, afraid of being rejected for their witness, and so they step back. And the witness of the church suffers because of that. But today is a brand new day. It's a new day, saints. Jesus, the good shepherd, is seeking for the sheep that got lost, too. And he leads the sheep that did not get lost. Last text for today in the book of Hebrews, the fourth chapter, beginning at verse six. Since therefore it remained for some to enter it, 
Those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain day. Today. Saying through David so long afterward, in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. He goes on in verse 14 to say, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Amen. Let us hold on to our confession regardless of the current situation. Let us hold on to our confession regardless of what anybody wants to say. I know we might be sitting in this old house, this beautiful old house. But this house was built on the promises of God. Amen. This people was sustained by the promises of the word of God. Amen. This congregation loves its neighbors because of the passion of the word of God. Amen. And this congregation shall endure because of the presence of our precious word of God. The one who lived and took flesh and dwelt among us. That living word sustains us. Bless his name. What's his name? Jesus. And he is risen. Yes, he is. And we're going to hold on to that confession. I don't care what the world says about it. We're going to stand on the rock of our salvation. I don't care who don't like it. We gonna keep on preaching Christ crucified. I don't care who wants to say that's past day. We gonna say the word of God is here to stay. Amen. And as we do that, saints, as we reach out with our shepherd to find our brother and sister sheep, let the peace of God it passes all understanding. God, your hearts and minds. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, let God's people say, Amen.